<clears throat> well, this evening, we're going to be looking at a portion of Psalm 119, which um, you perhaps recall is the, uh, the longest chapter in the Bible, I believe. It's 176 verses. Uh, we're going to have to get a, a running start at it if we're going to get through all of these. Actually, we just want to, uh, we just want to look at the first eight verses. Yeah. It, it really is a summary of everything that, that follows and I think gives us the, uh, the, well, at least the thrust, what it is we need to understand in order that we may really become more useful to the Lord. And really what we're looking at, as the title reminds us, is um, blamelessness. That's what we need to be pursuing, to be blameless before the Lord, because those are the ones who ultimately are blessed. Remember, we, we looked uh, earlier at Psalm chapter 1 regarding the blessing upon those that don't walk in the way of the wicked, but who delight in the law of the Lord and meditate on that law and who, who keep it. They're the ones who will be blessed. They're the ones whose lives will produce fruit because the Lord will use them. That's what distinguishes the, uh, the people the Lord uses uh, in Scripture. So let's begin just by reading this portion of Psalm 119, and then we'll, we'll just sort of review a bit what we looked at this morning, and then we'll look at what we can learn from this. So this is what the psalmist writes. How blessed are those whose way is blameless, who walk in the law of the Lord. How blessed are those who observe his testimonies, who seek him with all their heart. They also do no unrighteousness. They walk in his ways. You have ordained your precepts that we should keep them diligently. Oh, that my ways may be established to keep your statutes. Then I shall not be ashamed when I look upon all your commandments. I shall give thanks to you with uprightness of heart when I learn your righteous judgments. I shall keep your statutes. Do not forsake me utterly. Let me just remind you as we begin that these are not the, the words of, of a legalist, somebody who believed that they were justified by keeping the law of God. Uh, these are the words of a redeemed individual, one whose heart had been changed by God's grace so that they loved the law of God and wanted to honor him uh, by uh, living the life he calls them uh, to live. Uh, now again, uh, this morning we did consider a couple of different things. We considered um, how Paul evangelized and as we were looking at the context, the passage that we were focusing on, which is David, the idea of David being a man after God's own heart, we see how Paul really wove that into the gospel message. And out of that, we uh, looked at a couple of different things that would be helpful for us with regard to evangelism. Uh, the way that Paul evangelized, I think, is clear. He did it with the right motive. He did it out of, out of love. He did it because he loved the Lord, because of what the Lord had, had done for him, how the Lord gave himself to him and laid down his life for him. Paul wanted to give his life to the Lord. He wanted to serve the Lord. He knew what the Lord wanted him to do, called him to share the gospel, and so he did it for that reason. But he did it, secondly, because he loved his countrymen. He loved the Jews. Even though they hated him, for the most part, he was concerned for their well-being. And that concern for them, that love for them, helped him to overcome any of the fears that he was having to deal with to go into the synagogue in order to convince them, in order to prove to them, in order to show them that Jesus is the Christ. And again, this is just a reminder to us that, that we know the power of love. It's a very powerful thing. As a matter of fact, if we love something enough, it'll give us the motivation we need to overcome just about any obstacle in order to reach what it is that we desire. Well, we need this kind of love if we're going to reach out to others because this is what's going to help us overcome our fear. This is what's going to help us overcome the, you know, the, the idea that we might be rejected, the idea that people might, again, not like us or maybe do mean things to us. We need to love the Lord and we need to love our neighbor. And if we do, we will reach out because we know we need to if they're going to be saved. Uh, we also noticed in Paul that he did what he did in a particular way. I, I mentioned just a moment ago that 
that he wove um, basically Jesus into uh, the history of Israel. He wanted to connect Jesus to all the promises that God had made, showing them that he is the fulfillment of God's faithfulness to them. And really, that's something we need to do too. We need to connect Jesus to where people are. If, if, if the people we're ministering to have a church background and they haven't come to know Jesus, we need to try to draw from that experience, draw from that knowledge, and show them their need of Jesus Christ. If they have no church background, we need to try to connect Jesus to what they do know about God from the, the creation. That's, again, what Paul did when he was confronted with the Greek philosophers. They had no background in Judaism. So he didn't start with God's faithfulness to Israel. Instead, he started with natural revelation. God has revealed himself. He's shown his kindness and his mercy. And, and uh, then he uh, particularly shows the mercy of God in that he gave his son. So that's something of the methodology that we can follow. But the second thing we looked at this morning was the importance of having a life that in some measure uh, matches the message that we're bringing. We need to show them that Jesus actually does forgive and transform lives. He heals us uh, from our past. Uh, you know, consider Paul, how his life was transformed. Those who knew him <laughs> knew that his life was radically changed. He went from wanting to kill Christians to wanting to make Christians. And if people didn't know his background, Paul made sure that he told them what his background was as he, again, had opportunity uh, to speak before kings and governors. He would always share his testimony. He even shared it to the Jews at, at uh, Jerusalem who didn't know what happened uh, in Damascus. Uh, this is what I was, and this is what I am. Our lives need to demonstrate that transformation. Uh, David showed the life that God had put in his heart as well in, in various ways, in the way that he obeyed the Lord in the way that he trusted the Lord, in the way that he cared for the well-being of his people, not only physically but also spiritually, that they walk in the ways uh, of the Lord. And we saw that that's why the Lord chose him, because he wanted the king, that is, God wanted the king to be a picture of the king that he had promised to them from the tribe of Judah, the one he would one day raise up, the one he would one day send into the world. Saul was not suitable because Saul did not obey the Lord. David was a man after God's own heart, and that's, of course, what Jesus is, and that's what he wanted David to be a picture of. Now, again, these things need to be true of us as well. If we are to be useful to the Lord, if we are to share his gospel, we need to be able to show also its transforming power. And we saw that these things can be true of us as well. Remember that Paul did not come into the world as... Paul the Apostle, he came in as Saul the Pharisee. Uh, he was born and dead in trespass and sin. He had to be converted. David didn't come into the world as he became either. They both had to be converted, and they both had to work. They both had to use the grace that the Lord had given to them to become more like the Lord Jesus. Now, even in what they became, neither of them were perfect but I think we would agree that they were much more like Jesus than many, if not all, of the Christians that we see today, including ourselves. So tonight what I'd like to do is just simply zero in on how it is they became this way, what it is they were aiming at, uh, what their goal was. Uh, if we could summarize what it is they were all about in one sentence, I think it would be this that they tried their best, by God's grace, to live a blameless life. Now, this is something that um, we as Protestants, I think, tend, because we understand the grace of God, we tend not to take this as seriously as we should, because we know, and it's, it's really hammered into us, and we really do need to understand this, that our justification, our acceptance with God, being counted blameless in, in his eyes does not come from our works, but it comes purely from what Jesus Christ does, purely on the, gra on the basis of, of his grace alone. Salvation is by grace alone, and it is something we receive by faith alone. 
so that it might be by grace alone and not by works. Okay, that's something we're always, we always have hammered into us, but it tends to make us a little bit lax when it comes to works. Now, Roman Catholicism, on the other hand, we know goes in the opposite direction by making works a part of their justification. And virtually all Christian cults do exactly the same thing. They make our justification, our acceptance with God, again, based partly upon our works or even sometimes wholly upon our works. Now, the Roman, Roman Catholics believe that we are justified by grace alone. I think you've heard that before. But they believe we have to work for that grace. And they believe that God will only justify us, He will only declare us to be just and acceptable to Him when we actually become blameless. But the only way we can, be, can become blameless is by working for the grace that He will give to us through the sacraments, through the priesthood, okay? That's salvation. Not by grace alone, through faith alone, but that salvation by works even though there is grace, at least in their estimation, mixed in with it. Now, we do need to understand that we are justified by grace alone, that we receive that by faith alone, but we need to understand that we are not saved by a faith that is alone. The faith that justifies us is a working faith. Now, the, that's true. Now, but what I want us to see this morning or this evening is this. This is the point, that the harder we work at this process of sanctification, the more useful we are going to be to the Lord. You know, all of us, if we have saving faith, are going to be those that produce good works. But it's those who work harder at producing good works that are going to be the most useful to the Lord. And again, that's what we need to be aiming at. So our goal needs to be the same as Paul's. Remember, forgetting what lies behind, reaching forward that lies ahead. He, reaches, he, he strives to reach that, that call that, that God placed upon his life to produce that, that fruit, to become what he should be in the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, that's the same thing as, as David's goal. He wanted to honor the Lord in everything and the same goal as Jesus, which was to live a life that is blameless. Now, what I want us to see from our text this evening is this, that this is really what believers were seeking. Those that really wanted to honor the Lord, this is what they were seeking even in the Old Covenant. You know, this is, again are not the sentiments of a legalist who wanted to justify himself before the Lord. This are, are really the, the um, well, the, what do you want to say, the, the musings or the, the words of somebody who loves the Lord and really wants to honor him. So let's consider these eight verses. First of all, the writer begins by pronouncing a blessing on those who will live a blameless life. He says in verse 1, how blessed are those whose way is blameless. Now I think we all understand what blameless means, but let's look at it for just a moment. The word in, in the Hebrew means to be complete, to be sound, to be whole. It means to be innocent of, of any wrongdoing. It means to be a person of integrity. And what that means is that no one should be able to point the finger at you and lay a charge at your feet and make that charge stick. To be blameless is to be, of course, like Jesus, who really is the only one who ever lived a blameless life. And of course, that's the kind of life we would expect from one who is the Son of God in human flesh. But this is the kind of life that he had to live in order to save us. It had to be a perfect life. There was an occasion when Jesus challenged the Jews to bring a charge against him. In other words, he was challenging, uh, basically you know, showing his, his integrity, his blamelessness. But he says in John 8, 46, which one of you convicts me of sin? That is, which one of you can make a charge against me and make that charge stick? Well, the fact is, nobody could, really. They did make charges, but they made false charges against him. And, of course, when they put him on trial, 
the only way they could prosecute him, the only way they could find him guilty was by finding a couple of witnesses that were willing to perjure themselves and to bring lies against him, to bring a false witness. Jesus was absolutely blameless according to the law of God, and he is our example. Now, our goal should be to be as blameless as Jesus, realizing we're not going to reach it on this side of heaven, but the goal should be to be as much like him as we can possibly be. Now, let me just point out one other thing, too, and I think it's clear already. The psalmist here is not talking about what we as Protestants often mistake for this kind of blamelessness, which is the blamelessness of Jesus Christ imputed to us or given to us as a free gift. When we are clothed with Jesus' perfect life, with his perfect record, we are as perfect as he is. We are blameless, and that's why we are just. That's why we're justified in the sight of God, through the righteousness of Jesus. But that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about practical righteousness. We're talking about the way the life of Jesus works its way out in our lives. And I just want to point that out by the different ways the writer explains what he's talking about when he's talking about being blameless. And he, he, may, he says it in many different ways in verses 1 through 3. He says, how blessed are those whose way is blameless. So what does that mean? And he explains it. Who walk in the law of the Lord. How blessed are those who observe his testimonies, who seek him with all their heart. They also do no unrighteousness. They walk in his ways. You realize these are all just different ways of saying the same thing, but they're like differing perspectives. And when you can sort of walk around something and look at it from different angles, it, it just gives you a better understanding of what it is we're talking about. Now, he doesn't say here how blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord to justify him. The just shall live by faith, though those who trust him are blessed. But he's saying blessed are those who obey his law, who obey his testimonies, who seek him with all their heart, their whole heart, who do nothing wrong, but only do what is right. Now again, this is, this is the standard, this is the goal. Hold this up to David, at least during his good years. Don't, don't hold it up in his latter years, uh, because David failed, he wasn't perfect. But the reason why God chose him, the reason why he made him king, was here was a man who was doing these things. This was the kind of life he was living. <clears throat> Remember, this is the kind of life that Paul lived after the Lord saved him, and certainly it was true of Jesus. Now, stepping back for just a moment, the, the psalmist asks the question, why did God give us the commandments in the first place? I mean, wasn't this the purpose? I mean, did he do these things just to inform us so that, you know, maybe if we wanted to serve the Lord, this is how we could do it? Uh, did God give us his commandments so that we'd have something to talk about, something to preach about on the Lord's Day or something to talk about in our Bible studies? Um, he gave them to us, obviously, so that we would do them. The psalmist writes in, in verse 4, You have ordained your precepts. You've given them to us that we should keep them diligently. That's the reason. You've given them to us is that we might do this. You gave them to us. God gave these things to us as a blueprint for our lives uh, to chart the course for us from earth to heaven, to teach us what it means to be holy, what it means to live a life that's pleasing to Him, really to teach us what it means to be like, like our Lord Jesus Christ. If we want to be like Jesus, if we want to be blameless, the psalmist is telling us here we need to keep the commandments. But notice he says not just to keep them half-heartedly, but to keep them diligently. You have ordained your precepts that we should keep them diligently, which means at all times, in all places, and with all that we have to serve him. That's what it means to live a blameless life. Now, there's a reason the psalmist gives us as to why we should keep these commandments. There's really many reasons, of course, 
we do know that the Lord loves us, and, and if we don't keep the commandments, that, that He will discipline us. And so if we want fewer spankings, then we should obey Him. Uh, we should certainly obey Him because we love Him and because we love His Son. Remember what Jesus said to His disciples, if you love me, you will keep my commandments, John 14, verse 15. Our obedience is really the measure of our love for the Lord Jesus. The more we obey Him, the more we really do love Him. Now, again, there's many reasons why we should obey the Lord, but the psalmist points to one reason in particular, and perhaps it's the summary of all of them. It's because of the blessing that it brings. Look again at verse 1. How blessed are those whose way is blameless, who walk in the law of the Lord. Verse 2 says the same thing. How blessed are those who observe His testimonies. Now, to be blessed means among other things, to be happy. How happy is the one whose way is blameless? Now, how does obedience lead to happiness, lead to this blessedness? Well, again, there's many ways in which it does it. The more we obey, the more we're like Jesus. And if that's what we want to be, which is really what we do want to be because of the Spirit's work inside of our hearts, the happier we're going to be when we see ourselves living like Jesus. The more we obey and the less we sin, the less shame we're going to feel of the fact that we have let the Lord down. The stronger our assurance is going to be that we belong to Him because we see the life of Jesus coming out in our lives. The, the greater we know our reward is going to be in heaven. All these things, of course, are going to make us happy. But, but let's tie it to what we saw this morning regarding the lives of Paul and David and especially Jesus. The more we obey, the more that our lives are blameless, the happier we're going to be because the more the Lord is going to use us. Okay? The Lord chooses, more often than not, those who are blameless to do His greatest works to bring Him honor. Why did He choose David? rather than Saul. Well, he rejected Saul because Saul would not obey him. He chose David because here was a man after his own heart who will do all his will. Here was a man who would obey him. Now, that should be what makes us to be the happiest, and that is when we are used by the Lord in this way. But it, this kind of usefulness only comes in the path of obedience when we seek to be blameless. And so finally, we need to ask this question, what should we do in order to become blameless? And actually, the psalmist answers that question in the last four verses of this first part of the, of the psalm in verses 1 through 8. First of all, uh, notice the psalmist prayed. He prayed that the Lord would strengthen him, that he might be blameless. We read in verse 5, Oh, that my ways may be established to keep your statutes. He was asking the Lord to establish him in his word, to get his feet firmly planted on that path so that he would walk in the path of obedience. Now, we need to understand that we can't be blameless in our own strength. It's impossible for us to do that. That's why the Father sent his Son into the world. That's why the Son sent the Spirit that's why he tells us to pray and to look to him every day for strength. That's one of the reasons why we meet together for worship is to do the things the Lord has told us to do in order to gain the strength we need to be able to do these things. We need to pray. We need to ask that the Lord would establish our feet in the path of righteousness to keep his commandments, again by his grace, with the motive of love in order to honor and glorify him and not to justify ourselves. We don't want to fall into legalism. We always have to kind of walk that, that, you know, that edge, as it were, that, um, uh, that dividing line between legalism and, and what is, um, well, antinomianism and what the gospel is. We need to obey, but we need to obey with the right motive. Secondly, the psalmist looked at failure 
as a motive to get him to pray even more fervently because each time he failed and disobeyed the Lord, it brought shame to him. Now, again, we read in verses 5 and 6, Oh, that my ways may be established to keep your statutes. Then I shall not be ashamed when I look upon all your commandments. Now, how do we feel when we're reading the Bible and we're looking at the commandments of God and we, we realize we haven't kept the commandments? Or when we look at an example of those that really honor the Lord and then we look at ourselves and we realize we haven't done what they have done and yet they're really no different than we are remember we all share the same nature Elijah was a man of like nature as us and he prayed that it wouldn't rain for so so long a period of time and he prayed and it didn't rain and he prayed again and it did rain and we were encouraged by that that these people we read about in the Bible are really no different than we are and yet the Lord used them, but he hasn't used us. So how does that make us feel? Jesus called his disciples, calls us to make disciples of all the nations. Peter tells us to be ready at all times to give a reason for the hope that we have in gentleness and in fear. Paul, wherever he went, tried to convince everyone he met that they needed Jesus. I've only ever seen one person who actually tried to do that. But Paul, you know, he, he talked to his fellow Jews that hated him. He talked to the Gentiles. He tried to evangelize the soldiers that were in Caesar's house when he was arrested and brought to Rome. He even stood before governors and kings, and he very boldly told them that they were sinners and needed to repent. They needed to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Stephen was willing to do this even to the point of being stoned. He rebuked the rulers of Israel for their sins against God, knowing what they might very well do to him, that he would likely die. And we know that our Lord Jesus Christ spoke the truth to his own people, knowing that they would crucify him. Now, those are the things we have as examples in, in the Scripture. And when we compare our lives to the lives of these individuals, how does that make us feel? Well, if we really want to honor the Lord, it makes us feel somewhat ashamed because we don't want to dishonor him. We want to honor him. Well, that can be a very powerful motive in our prayers that the Lord would establish our ways in his paths, in his commandments, that he would give us the strength to obey him so that when we read the word of God, we're not constantly rebuked by the word of God and feel ashamed that we haven't lived up to what we actually could be doing by the strength and the power that the Lord gives to us. That is a possibility for us. Now thirdly, wanting to be blameless, he wanted to learn more about what God wanted him to do, what it means to be blameless. So he read God's word and every time the Lord showed him something new from the word, gave him more insight, he thanked him. We read in verse seven, I shall give thanks to you with uprightness of heart when I learn your righteous judgments. And perhaps the idea here of learning isn't just so much learning the truth, but actually experiencing these things in his own life as he put them into practice. If we want to be blameless, we have to know what blameless means. We have to know what it means to do the right thing, and we can only do that by reading God's word for his definition of what it means to be blameless. And when the Lord gives us more truth, and really, we're never going to understand everything that's in here. Every time we read the Bible, we can actually learn something new. And when we do, when God shows us something that will help us, we should thank Him for that truth and ask Him to continue to reveal more. But I do think that if we're not willing to live up to the truth that He shows us, the book will likely be closed to us we need to be willing to do. And that's what we come to in the final point where the psalmist resolved to do what the Lord showed him. Relying on his grace for the strength to carry it out. We read in verse 8 this. I shall keep your statutes. Do not forsake me utterly. By which I believe the psalmist means basically this. I will do what you say. 
Only do not leave me to do these things on my own. Don't forsake me. Don't leave me alone because I will utterly fail if you don't help me. So when we read the word and we're mining for this truth and the Lord shows us something, we need to be willing to put it into practice. We need to put into practice what we know before the Lord is going to show us more because perhaps the things he has shown us are the more important things we need to do first. So if we would be useful to the Lord, we must resolve by God's grace to live as blamelessly as humanly possible. And so if that is our desire, what we need to do is these things. We need to pray. We need to allow our, our previous failures to motivate us to pray even harder. We need to mine his word for his truth and be thankful when he reveals it and be resolved to do what he shows us in his word that we should do, relying on his strength alone to do it. Again, what makes a difference between someone the Lord uses powerfully and someone he doesn't use much at all? It's how blameless we are, how much we're seeking the Lord. God uses the blameless, whereas he sets aside the blameworthy. If we want to be truly happy, we're only going to find that happiness through usefulness. And that usefulness is only going to come by seeking to be blameless, by seeking to be like Jesus. So let's set our hearts to do that. Well, let's bow, shall we, for a moment of prayer, and let's ask the Lord to help us.